Thank you for the nice invitation to be here. So I will say in advance, I apologize to, I see some experts in the room. This is not talks for you. They're not meant at you. Um, so I hope to bore the experts. Um, and uh, I hope to get to some, some very new things, but I will start, well, at least for five minutes with ancient history. Then I will start with old things. And then tomorrow do some things that are a little bit new, and by the afternoon, I hope tell you some very recent results. Um, so, so the it, if I'm going the, the talks I'm going to talk about are multiple ergodic averages. It's impossible to not mention what the history is and why we study multiple ergodic averages. And my apologies that I missed some of the first talks, but I'm guessing somebody said Semereti's theorem at some point. But it was probably said, and so I think yeah. And I think everybody knows, uh, Yuri must have said this in his talks, what Semereti's theorem is. It says if you take a subset of integers with positive upper density, then it contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. OK, that's the purely combinatorial statement. We'll come back to combinatorial statements now and again. And the connection is the Furstenberg multiple recurrence theorem and Furstenberg's correspondence principle, which translates these problems into multiple recurrence. So I will just state it. Um, because it is really the motivating uh, result that started the, the, the field. Um, so first, I will also use this to set my notations. So the sigma algebra will always be the curly letter associated to the, to the, to the space. Um, so this is my measure preserving system. I will often omit the sigma algebra from my notation. So this would be a measure preserving system. Let k be an integer. For me, the integers start at 1. So these are the counting integers, 1, 2, 3. Um, so for any k, um, any measurable set of positive measure, then there exists a positive natural number such that the measure of a intersect t to the minus n a intersect t to the minus 2 n a t to the k minus 1, and we'll make it an arithmetic progression of length k is bigger than 0. So the exponents n, 2n, 3n up to kn, or k minus 1n, um, is the arithmetic progression that corresponds to some Reddy's theorem. OK? So uh, then let me just state um, the Furstenberg correspondence principle. Again, this is just for completeness and, and to, to, I would call this the ancient history of the subject. So is if you have a subset of the integers with positive upper density, okay, so what that, by that I mean that the limb soup of the average as you go out, uh, E intersects the first n integers and divide by n that this should be positive, then if you're looking at patterns in it, so you're looking at shift invariant patterns, so E intersect, let's write it as mm -hmm. e, I'll write it, e plus m1 intersect E plus m2, E plus mk. For example, if I'm looking at this intersection, well, that, um, I, for example, if I want to look at the density of this intersection, then there is, this is bounded from below by a corresponding measure, measurable statement. And so here are the corresponding measurable statement. I'll write it first and then I'll fill in what, what, what this is. t to the minus n1a intersect, although t to the minus, oh, these are m's I think here, mk a. So it's the measure of this. So there exists a system x. There exists, it's a measure preserving system. There exists a set a measurable the measure of A positive. In fact, I can take the measure of A to be equal to the density of E, such that this forms a lower bound for that. So in other words, if you want to understand translation invariant under any iterate m1, m2, this is true for all m1 up to mk, for all 
K and N. If I want to understand such patterns in the integers, it suffices to study the analog in the, in the um, measure preserving setting. So, um, and I will emphasize that this correspondence, the reason I wanted to state here, is it's not just something a particular about arithmetic progressions. The proof is general. It applies for whatever exponents you want to look, and that's why I wrote this as m1, m2, up to mk, and not just n, 2n, kn, which was the original way it was phrased. But there's no change um, in the proof. OK? So this, I would say, is the ancient history, the part from the 70s that we'll talk about. Um, the correspondence will still be used for every result that we get about a measure preserving system to translate it into a result about sets of positive upper density and the types of patterns that they contain. Okay? I won't give the proof unless you're really interested. Um, it's, um, it's in many textbooks, uh, so it's a classic thing. Um, let me just make one more comment about the multiple recurrence, though, to motivate further. We're talking about multiple averages, and the way this is phrased, the average is missing. Um, but what Furstenberg really showed was not just that there exists some n, but he showed that if I look at this and I average, I mean, as natural for any ergodic theorist, is you take something, you want to know something about it, well, you, don't, you can't say anything about it, so you average. Look at this thing, and he really showed that the limit of this was positive. So that would be the right way to phrase this, I think. It's not just the existence of an n. In fact, there exist infinitely many n from this statement. And you see the infinitely many n by looking at these averages. Okay. So that's the, the, the motivation of the problems. Um, and I guess I, I hope I don't need to say anything more about what I mean by a measure preserving system. You know, it's always going to be a quadruple like this. It's going to be my measure preserving systems are always probability spaces. So the measure of my space is equal to one. I will pretty much always assume um, all the basic things that I want. The sigma, the, the, the Borel, this is the Borel sigma algebra. It's countably generated. Um, so the reason I want that is I want LP to be separable. Um, and of course, I'm going to implicitly assume that every function or set I write down on the board is measurable. Okay, I don't have any measurability problems, so you know everything I write down is measurable. Um, whenever I write equality, I'm going to assume it means equality up to sets of measure zero. I'm just going to make all of these standard assumptions from, from now on. Um, and they're all probability spaces. Okay, so that's again another standard, standard assumption. Okay, let's see. So um, now, let me say just a couple more words. This, in Furstenberg, multiple recurrence was a limit. Okay, it was not a statement about the limit. And um, of course, been, again, in ergodic theory, you want to know usually about the limit. So let me just state the standard ergodic theorem. Again, this is, I would put this in the ancient, ancient history just to make sure. But I will use it again to set notation. If I have a system, and again, I'm going to omit the sigma algebra in general, um, the invariants, which really do depend on the whole system, but I will just write this as I, the invariant sigma algebra. Okay. So, so the way I guess I should view um, the pointwise ergodic theorem, we should state that Birkhoff. And the pointwise ergodic theorem, well, we may use it a few times, but you'll see in a moment that we won't have much to say about pointwise problems. Although I do know, I think Benji will say some things uh, in his talk on Friday um, um, about pointwise problems. So um, if I have a function, I guess let me do this for in L1. F in L1, if the system is fixed, x with the sigma algebra mu t, then if you look at the pointwise convergence, Then this converge, this is, I'm not assuming ergodicity, at least not for the moment, that this converges to the conditional expectation, which luckily was introduced. I will review what properties I need of it later, but Marcus introduced a lot of the objects that I need. That this is the conditional expectation project of F projected down onto the invariant sigma algebra. If the system is ergodic, then the, um, if X is ergodic, 
oh, and this is pointwise uh, for mu almost every x. Then if x is ergodic, um, then this is uh, the limit is the integral. Okay, because the only invariants are the constants. So, so that's the pointwise theorem. And let me just state, I meant to leave enough room here, but of course I didn't. So we'll fit the mean ergodic theorem here, which will be more relevant for many of the results that I'm going to state, because this is the one that we'll be able to generalize the most. Um, so for the mean ergodic theorem, um, I guess we could do it for any LP, as long as I guess P No, oh, I don't think it matters. It could have an infinity boundary. OK, um, then the convergence here now is mean. And, and so the convergence, again, uh, I want to view it as, the, as, as convergence down to the expectation. But now it's in L2, so 1 over n. And I will make the standard um, abuse of notation of writing this as t to the nf, where t now represents the associated unitary operator. OK, so, so the convergence, I will often write this as t to the nf. Um, this, again, converges. Same thing. I'll view it as the conditional expectation projected down onto the invariance. OK, and this is now convergence in L2 mu. And again, the answer is the integral of f if x is ergodic. You want an FP, right? What? You want an FP convergence? Oh, I could do it in LP. I don't care. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, now I have to remove infinity if you're going to do that to me. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, L2 is going to be the important one. Okay, so, so yeah, let me. So it's technically correct now. I've removed in infinity. I really, almost everything I will talk about will be mean convergence, so it'll always be L2. Okay. Um, and the reason I want to point out is that right here already we see a difference is that I could change this to make it uniform, meaning you can do this for any interval from m up to m plus n, n minus 1, just to be completely correct. It's a uniform convergence, or let me write this as n minus m, the, uh, going from n equals m up to n, as long as n minus m goes to infinity. OK, so uniform convergence, as long as the intervals get longer and longer, then I still get this convergence. This is not true in the pointwise ergodic theorem. There is no uniform analog, and this is one of the differences that, that comes up. So all of the results that we will talk about in mean, basically all of them, I believe, have uniform versions and the uniform convergence, whereas in the pointwise, this is not something that happens. Uh, eraser. This is tricky, huh? Tricky to keep to, to do anything without an eraser. Okay, so what types of problems I want to consider? Well, why did I write down multiple recurrence in the ergodic theorem? The ergodic theorem corresponds exactly to k is equal to one in this situation. Okay, so if I chop this off, and I was just looking <laughs> at this very first one, the average of a intersect t to the minus n a. This corresponds to, to the mean ergodic theorem, um, well, or pointwise, any one of these. So what are the types of questions that I want to consider? Well, already there's two questions that were already on the board. In fact, three questions sort of hidden on this board. Is one, is the one that I'm just erasing right now, that's the combinatorial question. OK, so what kinds of the types of problems that we'd, I'd like to, to talk about? First type of problem is translation invariant patterns in sets of positive upper density. OK, so for example, Samaretti's theorem says that any set of positive upper density contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And we want to talk about more general shift invariant patterns that are in any set of positive upper density. Okay. 
Furstenberg correspondence principle that I just erased, unfortunately, says, OK, this is equivalent. And it's an if and only if statement. Um, it's a, I'll say it in a second. But so this is equivalent to, to uh, talking about um, multiple, multiple recurrence in measure preserving systems. It's a very nice exercise to do the easy direction. Start with some Reddy's theorem that you know that instead of positive upper density and prove Furstenberg multiple recurrence from it. Assume the correspondence principle. There's something there to prove. But uh, start with the, the, the result on some Reddy's theorem and now prove, prove the multiple recurrence that I just erased. If you've never done that, it's a nice exercise to, to do. Short argument. Okay. Um, the more interesting, of course, is to go the converse, to use multiple recurrence to prove um, the combinatorial statement. That's the, the content of, of the correspondence principle is this direction. But the easy direction is going from here to here. And of course, the hard part in first and theorem is proving the multiple recurrence and having the idea. Well, let's not negate that part. Okay. And the third one after multiple recurrence is the, corris the, the corresponding statements of convergence. Okay, which is, okay, what's the limiting behavior of the associated averages? Okay, this is different than recurrence. Recurrence says that the associated averages, if you plug in, for example, a set of positive upper measure and look at the indicator function of that set, that you get positivity out. Okay, so just because I would know the limiting behavior, there's still a different thing to prove here to get multiple recurrence. And multiple recurrence certainly doesn't imply convergence, at least not a priori. Without some other assumptions. Okay, so maybe I should take these things and make them a little more precise. But here we are, we have a set of positive upper density, E, and what we're looking at, D star of E intersect uh, E minus N intersect up to E minus Kn. And we're looking for trying to show that this intersection is positive. And N is not just N, it can be other patterns. So maybe, there's uh, a color chalk, yeah. So we could do this as E minus A1 of N, where A is some, and here AK of N, where A1 of N up to AK of N are integers positive integers, and so we're looking at different patterns, maybe not just arithmetic progressions, okay? A particular case of arithmetic progressions is that this looks like m, m plus n, m plus 2n, up to m plus kn. Okay, this is, um, in a measure-preserving system, what we're looking at for the multiple recurrence, what you're looking at is exactly the statement that we had before, a minus t to the minus n a, up to t to the minus K and A, and we're asking now that this be positive where the measure of A is positive. And then, of course, more generally, I want to ask A1 of N up to AK of N. I'm often going to assume invertibility by passing to an invertible cover, so if I forget to write minus signs, let's just pretend everything is invertible. Okay, so that's the more general. And Instead of looking at a, 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 always you could also ask, for example, if I take some function f whose integral is positive, or differing functions f1 up to fk, all of whose integrals are positive, you could ask for positivity here in this. Okay? And then the associated averages, I will write these as the general case. So I will want to look at f1 of t to the and, well, I'll write it as a1 of n, x, f2 of t to the a2, fk, t to the ak, x, and let me average this. Okay, so the limiting behavior of such expressions for arbitrary exponents is what we're going to be looking at. If I wanted to, to get um, the multiple recurrence, I could take this guy, take its integral. Let's set all of these to be f, f. Okay. 
I could take all these to be f's that are the indicator function. And for example, if I'm looking at such a thing, I could look at the integral and then take the average of the integrals and look at 1 over n, sum n is equal to 0 up to n minus 1. And if f was equal to the indicator function of a set A, then I want to, would want to show that, for example, the lim-inf of this was positive to get recurrence. Okay, so the two are, two are related. But in this one, you can ask, okay, does the limit exist? In what sense does the limit exist, point-wise? Mean convergence uniformly, you know, and, and, and uh, more. And then the more interesting is not just does the limit exist, but can we get information about the limit to be able to deduce things like that kind of positivity that I would want? So AI still has zero density, right? There's no this is more interesting when the AI has zero density, and then you might want to normalize by something appropriate, right? Because I might want to change what the one over n is if they have zero density. But yes, we will definitely look at zero density sequences. So you, you sometimes want to, uh, yeah, lots of them. The squares, for example, or the primes. And those are examples that we will definitely talk about. Okay. And um, while I'm in this full generality, there's no reason I have to stick to a single transformation. We can look at transformations T1, T2, up to Tk. You could ask that they commute. You could ask that they generate a nilpotent group. You could ask that they be more general. You could ask for no information and ask all of the same questions. Does the limit exist? In what sense does the limit exist? Can I say something about the limit? Um, so for every one of these things, I can ask the same questions. Now, this is, this is not a, a natural thing to do, to, to look at commuting transformations. In fact, this corresponds exactly to the ZD version of Samaretti's theorem. Okay, Samaretti's theorem and ZD correspond, Z, Z, uh, D and K are all going to be the same. I'm going to warn you right now that, you know. Um, so if you want a multidimensional, for example, a Z2 version of Samaretti's theorem, meaning I take a subset of the lattice, Z2, with positive upper density, and I want to know that it contains arbitrarily long two-dimensional arithmetic progressions, this is the theorem of Furstenberg and Ketz-Nelson, the multiple recurrence. Um, general, D is, uh, K is not just two, but any number of terms. Um, that the first proof of that was via our Gothic theory looking at these averages with exponents n, 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 n. Okay? The reason it's just n is because now they commute. The case of Samaretti corresponds to t1 being t, so t to the n, t2 being t squared, so it becomes t to the 2n up to t to the kn. Okay, so it contains Samaretti's theorem as the one dimensional version. Um, uh, Furstenberg and Ketzelsen's theorem was first proven using our Gothic theory. Um, since now there are other proofs of this uh, via uh, combinatorics and hypergraph theory. There are several different proofs of it now, but that's much more recent um, development. Okay, but we will talk about some exponents for which there are no other proofs known right now other than the ergodic theory proofs. Okay, so, so this kind of thing corresponds to configurations in this first problem. I guess I'll write it up here. Um, so problem one becomes configurations not just in Z, but in ZD, or configurations in more general groups that you might want to look at. Again, what I mean by configurations, it means a configuration in a set of positive upper density. Um, the second, the multiple recurrence, would become now multiple recurrence in ZD or in bigger groups, no potent group of transformations, for example. You can ask for that. Um, and the, the associated multiple average is, well, convergence is convergence, OK? And, and all of the convergence problems. And really, um, my interest is, what's the limit and what is controlling the limit? And we'll spend a lot of time on that. Okay. So I guess the ultimate goal is what I would call Zelda, is to study the limiting behavior of these averages, I'm going to be sticking mostly to convergence, to show the existence of limits, and then to find formulas for the existence of limits or say something about them. And that something about them hopefully will lead to things like recurrence and others. And you get different answers if the, the t's have zero entropy or positive entropy? Or? Well, I don't know if the entropy plays a role. I don't, yeah. But you do get different answers if the t's are all t. 
empowers of T or if there's some commuting group or no potent group of transformations. So if they don't commute, you also can do something or is it really totally... Depends what you want. So, so there's, here's a general philosophy. Uh, here, here, let me tell you a general philosophy. If the exponents, the, 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 what you're looking at, if they're independent in some sense, for example, polynomials that are independent, then we don't, generally you're going to get convergence even if they don't commute. There are cases where you can do this. If there's something, now arithmetic progressions, they're pretty dependent, n, 2n, you know, and so on. Um, but it, the more independence you get, the easier things are. That would be a general philosophy. And maybe the other general meta theorem would be everything converges. <laughs> it's not true. There are examples of solvable. If I went to solvable group of transformations, there's a nice example paper of Bergelson and Leibman showing a lack of recurrence and a lack, I believe, of convergence as well. So, so there are things where they'll fall, fall down. I will state a very general theorem in a moment, which will maybe answer a lot of these questions. But let me tell you what are the techniques, since this is mostly the part that I'm going to be focusing on, is the convergence type problems. There are many different types of techniques that we will have. So what, what kinds of, and, and there's different, you know, I'm saying just convergence, but please understand that convergence is a whole bunch of different problems. Mean convergence, pointwise convergence, uniform convergence, et cetera. Okay, so what kinds of techniques? Well, the first technique that I'll spend most of today on, with a little bit on some other stuff, are structural techniques. So what do I mean by that? These are proofs where I tell you what the structure is that's controlling the averages. Okay, they give you the most precise information. Okay? It's a decomposition result uh, something very similar that happens in what I alluded to in the ergodic theorems. In the ergodic theorems, if your system is ergodic, you um, project it, your answer is the integral. If your system is not ergodic, you cut down to the projection of the functions onto the invariant sigma algebra. That's a type of structure that's in any system. It has an invariant sigma algebra. Okay, maybe it's trivial, right, but it's still there. Um, for ergodic systems is trivia. So those are structural results when I'm going to tell you where you need to look to get the answer. Another technique is, let's say I'm having trouble with my system. I give you my system X, associated sigma algebra measure, et cetera, transformation, and you, can't, you, you have some average you want to study in it, but you don't know how to do it. Well, if you pass to an extension, which luckily Marcus introduced um, factors and extensions for me, so I can say this quickly, if you pass to an extension, if you were able to prove convergence in the extension, well, you have already proven now convergence in the factor, right? So that's another way. And this might sound like a simple, a silly thing to do, right? I couldn't do it here. Why am I going to something bigger? Well, sometimes you can go to something bigger and make the transformations look very distinct and now use this type of independence that I was alluding to to prove convergence. So sometimes it does help to pass to an extension and then be able to say, prove things up there. Um, Another technique is you translate the problem to something finitary, a combinatorial problem. Something when you're looking at averages of bounded sequences of numbers and you're going to tell me what happens to those averages. This is a technique that, well, in some sense, you, you see this if you want to take some Meridi's theorem and prove Furstenberg multiple recurrence. You can do this, but it's not about convergence that, right? So there's a different thing going on here. For the recurrence version of this problem, this is not a new idea. But this, this translation of an ergodic average to a purely combinatorial thing um, was done about, uh, I don't know, by now, eight years or something, by Tao. Um, and it's been a very effective technique that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, another technique that we're going to use is, you want to prove convergence for this guy? I don't know how to do it. I'm going to use compare it to somebody else that I know. Compare it to a known average. And then use that known average as a black box. Okay, You have to show that the difference is small in some appropriate sense that doesn't blow up when you average. But then I use this other result as a black box and say convergence here implies convergence there. So these are sort of conditional results, but when I compare it to something that I know the convergence of, I get a non-conditional result. Okay, this is a powerful technique. I will definitely talk about this extensively tomorrow, I think, um, for, 
And of course, you know, these techniques, you know, combine them. And, and that's where some very interesting recent work that I hopefully I'll tell you some about a frenzy kinakis and host that happened on uh, combining these things in the last few months even. Okay? So that's maybe the, the types of, I, I guess I would view this as the types of things I want to tell you about um, in, in the theory of convergence. And, and what are, so hopefully you'll have an example of each of these techniques at the end. Before you arrive, uh, what is the norm about if you take just function of uh, k variables and uh, apply those to so, so I want to uh, product, uh, single function of variables? Ah, yes, yeah, so, so you mean if up here, if I do functions of multivariate, uh, like a polynomial of k variables? You just take a function of uh, k variables and to first variable you apply t1, to second t2. It's not a program. No, it's a program. So you mean F of? If I choose this on the compact, uh, yeah, yeah. If it's continuous and then on compact, then you have just on the stress. Uh, right. And in general. And in general, for many of them, you can you can extend the theory um, for for multi-valued function. For for many of these results, I don't think it would make any difference. I'd have to think about some of them. Um, for arithmetic progressions, this works because we, we can do it there, but in more general, I'd have to think about it. Okay, so the first set of exponents I want to talk about will be polynomials as an example. So not just arithmetic progressions, but polynomials. Um, first, let's start with the single transformation. Um, a single transformation, polynomial iterates. And here, um, this is, well, Host and myself, in many cases, there's one case that is proven by Leibman um, that for, we didn't prove. So here we'll take, I guess I'll state it completely, measure preserving system, um, D polynomials. So P I of N will be polynomials, um, taking the integers to the integers. Uh, I guess for convergence, I don't really need anything else. Um, F1 up to FD, I will just write them as bounded functions for this. And then the answer is that here, if you want to look at L2 convergence, so the limit of F1 T to the P1 of N up to FD T to the PD of N, that this exists in L2. Okay, so the limit exists in L2 for, for this one. There are many, many partial results that are going to precede, precede every convergence result that I write down. I won't go through all the history because we'll spend the whole time doing. What? PIs are polynomials. Oh, I didn't write that. Yeah, sorry, polynomial. Thank you, yeah. Okay, so many, many results, the result, I won't give all of the history. Um, the Samaretti's theorem corresponds to the case n, 2n up to dn for a single transformation. Um, this is just a single t, but the proof of this, at least in this form, the way it was proven. No, no, this is convergence. If I want to say something about the limit, you're right, I need something more. But for the moment, I'm just talking about convergence. Okay. There are many, as, as Yuri point, points out, there are many other results one can say. Recurrence for this was known previously. This is the result of Bergelson and Leibman, the polynomial ergodic theorem. But recurrence corresponding to the limit of this being positive, um, for that you want the polynomials to take on zero at zero. 
Um, there's obvious obstructions if you only look at the odd integers in a system with two pieces. Obviously, that's very hard to come back under an even time. Uh, so you only come back under an even time, rather. Very hard to come back under an odd time. So, so recurrence was known for this situation, um, but I'm talking here about uh, convergence. Okay. Immediately, once you get convergence, uh, uh, sorry, recurrence, rather, that corresponds to the combinatorial statement, the polynomial version of Simredi's theorem. Recurrence is a different uh, convergence. Oh. This is jet lag talking. I can't dis distinguish between recurrence and convergence. OK, so, so that's a, it's a different problem, though, the question of recurrence. The proof here that was given by Host and myself, and then the same ideas used by, by Leibman in his proof of completing um, the case that we missed, um, is a structural proof. Meaning, let me be a little more explicit, it's like the proof of the mean ergodic theorem in the sense where you project a function down to its invariant sigma algebra and the orthogonal complement, and you decompose every function there. But it will take me some time, and I hope to get to that today, to tell you what the structures are here. The structures are more complicated than just the invariant sigma algebra. If, if you have some kinds of independence, for example, if these polynomials were n, n squared, n to the d. This is a, this here, it turns out, is an easier case to deal with in the sense that the structures that control it are only the invariant sigma algebra, it turns out, for independent polynomials. That's a result of Frenzy Kinakis and myself. Um, and in fact, in that case, if you were a totally ergodic system and if you had independent polynomials, then we can say a lot about the limit it converges to the product of the integrals. I mean, so there's a lot more structure that's there. But there's a problem with that proof, is that proof relies on this general structural theory. And here, the structure, I'll just you know, tell you what the punchline is. It's nil systems, but you know, in order to state that precisely, I will have to introduce some more things. So, um, so the, the point here is that you have to get some kind of geometric or algebraic description of what's controlling these averages in order to be able to say something about convergence and to say more precisely what the limit is, at least in the cases where we know. Okay. But right here, you get to one of the first questions, open questions. We don't have a simple form or an answer for what the limit actually looks like in general for arbitrary polynomials. I can tell you for independent polynomials. I can tell you for lots of particular cases, if you give me, you know, here's what the limit is. But if you give me arbitrary, I would like to know exactly what's the minimal factor controlling these guys, and therefore what does the limit look like as an integral over that factor, and we don't know what the minimal factor is. So maybe I'll make that a little more precise. Now, let me also emphasize another thing here, is that this is an L2 result. It's mean convergence. Okay, The question of pointwise convergence, the analog of Birkhoff, is open. There are some very particular cases of pointwise convergence where we do know the answer. Borgand's theorem. Um, so Borgand's theorem says if I look at f of t to the nx, f1, uh, f2 of t to the 2nx, this converges, this is Borgand, this limit exists from u almost every x. Okay, that's a, the pointwise with the iterates n and 2n. And the identifies the limit or not the limit? Uh, well, the limit will be the same as the L2 limit. So we know if it converges, we know what the limit will be because we do know the L2 limit of this one. But this is a very particular case, n and 2n. It's only true for two transformations, two, two terms, not more. And it's, well, the exponents, any two linear exponents here, n and 12n, that's okay. But uh, it does not, n and n squared, pointwise, the simplest one, is open. Are there the situations where it can be uniform, this convergence, in a topological context? Like it's just so in these ones, it's uniform, in the L2 versions. In the pointwise, no. No, but I was also talking about uniform in X. Would it be uniform in X? Oh, hmm. Like, for instance, the ergodic theory, if you have a complex situation. If you have, he's saying, if you assume unique ergodicity, uh, the multiple versions, I don't think they will be uniform. You're saying yes, but I don't think they're uniform. 
I think with multiple, you'd have a problem with uniformity. Right. But I can think about that. OK? So that's a single transformation. We will talk more about how to prove these things. So you mean like unique ergodicity, if I assume unique ergodicity, I get uniform convergence for every x, it's every continuous function that converges uniformly for all x and x. The analog for multiple, I must fail. <laughs> it's OK, so that's a single transformation. But there is the recent result a few years ago, multiple transformations. Again, I'm going to stick to polynomial, the polynomial. And this is a theorem of Walsh. It's from about 2012. And what does he prove? He proves that if you give me a mesh preserving system, so here I'm going to have x mu. Uh, let me just write my probability space as x mu. And I'm going to have d transformations. Commuting, let me get my, oh, I wrote it as r here. And if I don't stick with my notes, t1 up to tr are commuting. Okay, not necessarily powers of the same transformation, okay? So, um, of course, x is a probability space. And um, polynomials, uh, the polynomials, I'll index them because it's a, they could also be polynomials from ZD, but I'm just not gonna, I'm gonna, ZL, I need, would need more letters, so I'm not gonna write that down. Okay, so they're polynomials. This is for i going from 1 to d, and I guess j going from 1 to r. OK, so they're integer-valued polynomials. Um, function, so f1 up to fr. Uh, I know the way I wrote it. This is going to be fd. These are L infinity bounded functions. And then what he shows is that you can take their mean, the mean ergodic theorem, but now I'm going to take the averages over products of these things. So this is going to be the product. Well, I'll figure out which product is which. One of them will be uh, 1 to r, and one of them will be 1, I, 1 to d. I think I wrote it down. but So you take products of commuting transformations evaluated p, i, j at n. OK, now let me figure out which one. So this one is going to be product of all of the transformations. So this should be j, j going from 1 up to r. And this is i going from 1 up to d. So this, sorry, uh, missing a function. Yeah, they're, poly they're polynomials, but I'm allowing you to do is a different polynomial for each transformation. Okay. So this exists in L2. And there's a uniform version of it where the averages move out. OK. In an ergodic situation, we will see an example. The limit can be non constant. Even in this situation, as soon as, yeah. As soon as we have two transformations, there's no, no constant. It's not a, it's, it has to be a more complicated. And in fact, he proved a more general statement. He didn't just prove that this holds for commuting transformations. He proved, actually, if um, they generate a nilpotent, nilpotent group, if it's a nilpotent group of transformations. OK, it's a very, very general statement. OK? Now, the reason I'm putting these two results up simultaneously is here, the proof is a very different type of proof. It is not structural at all in its nature. It's really a combinatorial statement. Okay, he translates the problem to a finitary problem. And because of this, it doesn't, it says, he proves the existence of the limit, but it does not give us information on what the limit is. In fact, for example, it does not give us, even if you plug in all of the f's being the indicator functions, positivity does not come out from this, from this proof. Well, it doesn't come out from this proof either, but with a lot more work, one can get positivity. But from here, you don't get positivity. You, you do not see what the limit is. You do not know what controls the limit. 
Okay, so it's, it's a... Um, the case here of linear exponents for commuting, not for the nilpotent, but if you had linear exponents here, and this average, not the uniform version, this was first done by Tau, and this is this paper, I think it came out in about 2008, 2010, something like that. And this was really a new idea, brought new ideas to these averages and showed the convergence of these guys for commuting. Okay, that proof is, it was really a purely combinatorial problem, uh, translated to a purely combinatorial problem and solving that combinatorial problem. That proof was later retranslated, reimported into ergodic theory by Austin. And he gave a more ergodic proof of the statement. Again, this is linear exponents here, linear polynomials, and commuting, not the nail potent. And then Austin's proof was retranslated furthermore into more of the theory of, of um, semi-norms and some of the things that I might get to talking about by host, and again, gave an ergodic proof. Both Austin's and host's proof give the uniform version. It comes out for free in these methods. Tau's the uniform, so I could do the average from m up to n as long as n minus m goes to infinity. Okay. Um, whereas Tau's proof, uh, the translation did not do that. Um, but Walsh's method is robust. It gives the uniform version. It gives not just for commuting. It gives arbitrary exponents, uh, polynomial exponents, and it works for nilpotent group of transformations. So it's really a very, very general theorem that we can use as a black box for proving other convergence results. Okay. Pointwise, completely open. I mean, it's open for single transformation and it's iterates. Okay, so obviously it's open for this one. And Austin's proof, does it uh, prove also that it's positive or just that this is No. It's not a structural proof in the sense of telling me what controls things. So isn't there an extension of Austin's technique to prove the cover of Walsh theory even more? It does, but it still doesn't give positivity. It's no, not okay. structural. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I want to you know, distinguish between combinatorial proofs and structural proofs. Structural proofs which give you information on the limit. So maybe I should just say a few words about what, what do I mean by it's not structural at all. So they reformulate this problem as a finite quantitative convergence problem where you're looking at averages of some bounded sequences or averages, an average of products of bounded sequences. And, and that's the first step in this proof. Then you take these sequences and you decompose them into a part that's the structured part and a part that averages to zero. So there is some structured part. In the ergodic world, now when you get down to this part that you know is structured, you spend a lot of time proving that there is this structure there and what that structure is and how to use it. In the finite world, when you get down to this part of the structured part, you prove convergence for the structured part by some kind of averaging without worrying about exactly what it is. And this is an averaging, okay, there's an induction there. It's an induction on sort of the complexity of the objects that you're averaging, but it doesn't tell you much about what's going on there, okay? So, so there's an induction, but it doesn't, no real analysis is going on about what the structured part is and no real information about what the limit is, therefore, okay? So that's... Back to the proof is simpler this way. Simpler. I mean, is it, it's, it's, it's a hard idea. I mean, you use the Hambanic theorem somewhere in there to give these decompositions of spaces. Uh, it's short. You know, the proof, the whole proof is, is relatively, you know, it's a, it's a short argument, much shorter than the structural proofs of giving this. Yeah. So in that sense, I don't know. I, I, it's... it's well, of course, it's one's own work versus somebody else. You know, I think this proof makes more sense to me. <laughs> but, but, do you know, I think this proof has a natural, once you know what to look for, here's a bunch of, this is what I'm going to try to prove. Whereas here, I think there's really an, an abstract idea that it has yet to be fully understood as to why it works and what it's telling you about what the average is. Right, the, So here, there's more of a program, like steps that you have to follow and well, here there is two, and, and in a sense, he was following these steps of Tau, but in a much, uh, there's new ideas that were also required for dealing with this abstract generality, yeah. So, do I have a few more minutes? Because I started a little late. So, all right, okay. So, um, I, I think there's still more to be understood about these proofs. Um, the proof of Tau and the proof of Walsh and, and what it means. And one thing you really want to know is what kinds of structures control these averages. I will, you know, first have to be more explicit to tell... 
So, so, so the proof for when all the transformations are t and linear iterates, that is tau's proof. Um, Austin's, uh, Austin, I mean, Walsh's proof is more complicated because it deals with much more general and needed new ideas. It's not just tau's proof now abstractified to t generating an impotent group. There's, and it also co co covers polynomials. Tau's proof could not cover polynomials. Neither could the original proof of Austin or Host's proof. It, doesn't, it does not work for polynomials their proofs. Because what their proofs are doing, and Tau's in some sense, uh, theirs is the ergodic translation of Tau's, but in the ergodic theory world, you can see what they're doing. They take the system X, they go up to an extension of this. They prove the convergence up in this extension because what they've done is they've made the transformations, um, the commuting transformations, now really look like they're quite different. So you can see how they're acting in a different way. When you go up to this extension, if you started with polynomials, you lose structure of how they were related. Uh, it's about the same. Yeah, you don't really gain much. That's... Okay, so maybe just today what I will do is, because um, I don't really, won't have time to delve into an example of a structural proof, what I will do is give you a little bit of an overview of other iterates, polynomials, the ones I'm erasing now, and we will talk more about polynomials. But there are many other exponents, the A's that I wrote down earlier, for which we have various types of convergence, all of which now are going to be mean convergence. Um, I, I do want to just say one thing further about pointwise, which I meant to say earlier, is that when you take iterates of a sing, uh, uh, T1, T2 with linear iterates, and you're looking at the pointwise conversions, there are recent results of taking that and translating the problem into a problem about, um, uh, you translate it into a problem to use Jewett Krieger uh, to go back to your uniquely ergodic models. And you find a uniquely ergodic model for these things where convergence is easy for all of these, including multiple, not uniform versions, but multiple convergence. Um, and this is a program that was started by Huang, Xiao, and Ye. Um, and I think Benji will say something about their proof. It does not prove the general case of convergence, but it does prove when, all the, when, when the transformations are, um, if it's a distal system, rather. And this has been generalized for commuting transformations by uh, Sebastian Donazo and Wenbo Sun. Um, now they've taken the same method of finding models and, and proving convergence for that. So that's a recent paper. But what about other L2 results? So. One thing that you can do is, mm, okay, let me figure out what I'm gonna normalize by in a second. Yeah, if I'm looking at averages like this, t to the n, t to the m, and t to the n plus mx. Okay, this is a cubic average where the exponents are n, m, n, and m. And so I guess here, uh, zero up to, well, they're uniform. M is equal to N up to N plus N minus one. So these types of averages, there's, uh, here there's two, so N and M, so I should square it. These types of averages converge. It's this first cubic average. They play an important role because the cubic average is, the, there are cubic structures in an analog of this. So what do I mean by cubic? These look like parallelograms, N, M, M plus M. And I could continue going and add more terms. So this, this, uh, the convergence of this guy in L2 was proven by Bergelson, and I can add more terms to so make this three terms, and now I'm going to take all of this and translate by K. So F of T to the K, X, F of T to the N plus K, M plus K, let's see what terms I've missed, uh, the F of T to the N plus N plus K. Okay, this is a more general three-dimensional cube, and you see there's a three-dimensional parallel pipette being formed by the iterates. The convergence of this in L2 was proven by Host and myself for uh, more terms. Okay, I don't want to introduce the notation for how to write the general cubic averages, but you can see exactly what it would be. You take this guy and translate. If I stick in F of X, it's easier to see translating the whole previous guy by another term. Yeah. Here you take cubes and if you take synthesis. If uh, you take n less or equal to n. n less than or equal to? n less or equal than n, small. 
at this end less than, so the two dimensional, like this, triangles. Uh, yeah, that should convert, but that would, you'd have to do something to prove that. But this is not fair mercy. No, 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 I know. It's, uh, it, I'd have, hmm. Mm, for two, yeah. <laughs> I think he was asking more about Mahayar. I don't know. I'd have to think about it, but I think it should. So, so L2 convergence is known. In fact, for this one, pointwise convergence is known. Asani proved the pointwise convergence of these things. Again, what controls these averages, it's a structural proof. What controls them is these nil systems, which I will define, I guess, tomorrow by now. Um, and and the, because in nil systems, uh, the, the pointwise results there are old, um, and one can extend them to this case. What Asani did is extend the pointwise result here outside of the null system. This converges to zero, and so it's, it's possible. And more generally, this calls for commuting transformations. Um, there's no, this, this, these could be one, two, three, and there, are, you know, I suppose. Also positive. So, okay, so, so, so for many of these, you do get positivity. You get, in fact, here, um, this converges. If, if f was the equal to the indicator function, you get the measure of the set to the right number of powers. <laughs> Ergodicity, yes. Yeah. So here you do get positivity for all of these. Um, in general, that the limit is not so simple. Here, this goes back to what I said to you earlier. The iterates are independent in some sense, and so everything becomes separated and, and it becomes easier to deal with. Okay, more general iterate. So let me write down the general average that we had originally. Uh, let me just write as t to the a1n f1 up to t to the akn of fk, and I'll tell you various other choices of the ais that you can do. You can take the AIs to be the linear, uh, the, uh, the integer parts of real polynomials, okay? And you still get, you get convergence. Um, this is a recent paper, I think it's still to appear, and I don't want to misspell his name, by Kotsagianis. Kotsagianis, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. Hmm. Okay, the linear case, this is for, for real integer part, integer part of real polynomials. These are my choices of the AIs. And the linear case was proven by a student of mine a few years earlier than this um, um, when Bosun uh, has proven that, that statement. Okay, there are other ones. For example, there are various sequences that arise from Hardy fields, um, and this is a lot of work on this by um, Nikos Franzikinakis and then Franzikinakis and Virdal and Franzikinakis in combination with several other people. So what do I mean by that? So some choices would be, for example, you could take the sequence n to the a and the integer part for n to the a in some a bigger than zero. And so this would be a1 and then a k. Let's take a1 of n to be equal to this and a k of n is k times that, so a2. So the take the, along the arithmetic progression where now the differences look like this kind of things. But this is, this is from the work of Franzikinakis. And there's many more general ones. I mean, I'm just writing down, you could do things like take the greatest, you could take the iterates, the a-n's to be the same kinds of things n log n and the integer part in n log n, or you can do n squared plus n log n, take the integer part there. There's a whole bunch, many, many more. Um, so, so this should be slowly varying or something? I mean, yeah, so what's the idea is there's some sequences of polynomial growth. They're, they're, these things are all sort of polynomial growth. And, um, and, and with some independence on, the, these are all results for a single, iterates of a single transformation T, but if you have some kinds of independence on the different choices, I don't have to always do them as an, 2an, k, 
K-A-N, you know, you can mo do more general where the, each A-I is independent from the previous ones. Then, again, this philosophy kicks in. It works for commuting transformations, and in some cases it works for non-commuting transformations, uh, general. And there's a paper of Chu and Franzikinakis that does various cases there. There's another paper of Chu, Franzikinakis, and Host that does various such sequences like that. Another one that I will talk about tomorrow, um, prime iterates. Okay, so you'd like to look at um, this being, um, you're going to average, now it makes sense to normalize by the number of primes, P of N up to N, so N prime, N less than some capital N, and now this will be a prime, N up to K times that prime, these iterates become. So prime iterates, there's a long history, uh, maybe I have to check all the different history for tomorrow, but there's a um, variety of different papers of host, Franzikinakis and myself, uh, Woolley and Ziegler, Bergelson, Leibman and Ziegler, and various combinations of those authors. <coughs> not for, for mean convergence. Not for, he's done many things. Right? Um, one can do certain um, random iterates. Uh, so, and, and maybe I'll say a little bit more about a more precise result on that tomorrow. Um, but random sequences of iterates that have zero density, so, so they become interesting. Um, there's a paper of Franzikinakis, uh, Lucinia, and Virdal, which does something <coughs> like that. So there are, there are quite a few others that I think I've left out of this list, um, but maybe I will stop there for today. Thanks.